This is SciBite for June 26, 2012. Hi everyone and welcome to SciBite. This is episode 52 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast. We recorded this episode live on June 26, 2012. My name is Chris and joining us like every week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey, happy science to you, Heather. What's coming happy up this science. week? Today, we're going to take a look at extreme exoplanets, saving languages, the 50 gigapixel camera, oh. a positive work environment, medical diagnostic tools, spacecraft updates, and as always, take a peek back into history and up in the sky this week. Well, I could always use a good positive work environment. I think I, I need know. to, that sounds like something I need to address. So why don't we get into yes. the news? All right, let's cover that first story. Okay. There have been a couple of extreme exoplanet discoveries, a um, couple of discoveries to talk about. One, dealing with the Kilo degree extreme little telescope, KILT. This is a ground-based telescope, essentially a high dig a high-end digital camera, but kind of on the realm of the Hubble hmm. too. Uh, I mean, a little less diminutive than the Kepler. Sorry, the Kepler we see okay. in space is discovering all these planets. Yeah, and it actually discovered a planet, but from the ground. So it was wow, cool. You know, it's a a real cheap alternative. It only. It costs less than $75,000, the hardware for it. Wow, so, that seems like such a good deal, too. Yeah, so extreme, you know, low-cost, off-the-shelf technology. And they were able to, it's um, similar to Kepler that they're not looking at, you know, they're looking at a group of stars. But this one, essentially there's one in the north and one in the south. And together they observe millions of bright stars at a low resolution. Hmm. So they're kind of taking a picture of all this wide chunk of the, the sky and they're watching for these dips, you know, the transits when the planet pa passes in front of the star. So it's going to make the, the light come uh, driving to the Earth a little bit dimmer. So one of the ones, they found um, a little system of these. The system is about uh, a little over 800 light years away, hmm. constellation of Andromeda. Um, one of the larger of the planets is probably mostly hydrogen, uh, metallic of which uh, probably a little bit bigger than Jupiter but like 27 times the mass of Jupiter wow this thing is really really massive big boy yeah really dense so they almost consider it like a brown dwarf which is sort of a failed star so there's kind of sometimes there's this hazy area between but we can't quite tell what's going on you know it's laid out like a star but there's not enough um, to ignite to create a star. Hmm. So, so, so they found this huge planet, very massive, orbits, you know, in a full star in 29 hours. So it is booking it. Yeah, it's a big boy going star. real fast. <laughs> yeah. So, so close, so big, really close in, really fast, probably over 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and like 6,000 times the radiation that hits the Earth. So, you're going to need like SPF a million, at least. SPF a million, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, no kidding. Or if, you know, you, to bake at the proper temperature. The the other planet in the system slather that they found. Slather with butter. Yes, slather with butter. <laughs> uh, the other planet they found was only about 360 light years away. Okay. About uh, 50 about half as much mass as Jupiter, uh, but about 30% larger. Hmm. So not quite as bad as the other one. It's a little bit bigger, a little bit more massive. And what's interesting about this one is the star that orbits around can actually be seen through binoculars. Now, you're not going to see the dimming because it's, you know, very small percentage, but you can actually see the star from binoculars and say, hey, that star has a planet. And you can see it with binoculars. That's cool. You won't be able to see the planet. No, no, because it, it's you're not going to see that dimming. No, but the fact that you can know that star's there, and you can actually look at it with kind of as close to the naked eye as we can get and see that far. Yeah, mm -hmm. and 
it's a little bit bigger than our sun. So it's pretty interesting that this, you know, that's so luminous that they're making, because you, know, you can see it from binoculars, it means it's so close, so luminous, that they're actually going to be able to look through the atmosphere of the planet. So they're going to be able to shine, the, they can see the star's light shine through the atmosphere of this, you know, giant Jupiter, uh, super Jupiter planet. It's just amazing what we can do from that far away. Yeah. So it'll be a little while before they can observe it because of the way everything lays out. It'll be um, November before the Northern Telescope can observe it again. But mm. at that point, they're going to try to, you know, hook up with that. And actually, um, the Hubble and the Spitzer taste Space telescopes are also going to get in on it. So they're all going to be pointed at this planet trying to see what they can. So all of them are going to be looking at see if anybody can catch anything about the atmosphere of this planet. And then they're trying to just probably they're probably trying to get more information about what kind of planet it is, right? Well, yeah, get the the more information you have, the better. So if they can figure out the atmosphere, they can figure out a lot more of what's going on there. They I mean, you kind of have to make estimates about what these planets are made of based upon, you know, the density. So you have a specific mass, you know, how big it is, you know, how approximately how dense it is, depending on how much it's wobbling the star. So you can get the density and, you know, the temperature, however close it is to the star, you can kind of make a, a pretty good guess about, all right, in order to survive this heat and be this dense, it's going to be roughly this or this combination of stuff. But if you can see through the atmosphere, then it gives you a more accurate, you know, analysis of what exactly is going on. And if we can get that, I mean, it's it's one of those that you can see, make a pinpoint in this, a landmark in this specific case, and then apply it to other cases. Well, this is pretty similar. So let's see, over here, it was like this. So I bet it's kind of similar over here. Mm -hmm. Right. So almost like we've talked about, um, you know, <laughs> the first thing that pops into my head is dinosaur bones. Mm -hmm. So if you have, you know, two kind of cousin dinosaurs, and you're like, oh, this works over here. We know how it works. So we've only have a couple pieces. We can kind of match up what everything should look like over here. Yeah. Another set that they kind of saw this week, I kind of group these together when they come out. And they seem to come out in, in groups of these crazy, you know, planet combinations. <laughs> the other one is some really closely orbiting planets. These are, um, start about 200 light years away. So, the binary planet stars, orbits, they're so close, the planets are so close to each other mm -hmm. that you could actually see one rise in the night sky of the other. That would be... That'd be weird. Yeah, and it would be a little less than the size of the moon. So, there's one of the pictures in the, you know, in the show notes of a giant Neptune behind the skyline of Seattle. That'd be beautiful. And it's kind of creepy. Yeah. yeah it's kind of creepy. It does have, it's because it's so alien to us, but yeah. I think if you saw it all the time, it'd be really cool. Yeah. But it's interesting because we didn't really think that planets could come into sync this, this well. I mean, every 97 days, they come into conjunction. So they'd be visible in each other's sky. But the fact that these two planets could be in orbit, stable. Yeah. I mean, they're 20 times closer than any other two planets in our solar system. I mean, and both of them are like three times closer. And from than, what, what we can observe, they're not ripping each other up, right? No, they're they're stable. They're just going around and they have their nice little their little pattern. So every 97 days they come into each other. You know, so, I mean, they're, in density, there's different as Saturn and Earth. Hmm. But they're separated by only about five times the distance between the Earth and the moon. Huh. So they're really close. Yeah. Um, the star itself probably a bit hotter than our uh, our sun, a lot older, and these are the only two planets that are known to be there right now. One of the planets is about cooks around the uh, sun in about fourteen days. Kind of a, a super Earth. This is one of the rocky ones, about four and a half times the massive as Earth. That close with that kind of temperature, there's probably going to be lava flows. On mm. the surface of the planet. Sure. Yeah, it's gonna be so, it's gonna be like kinda yeah. That's gotta be really hot. Yeah, it's gonna be really hot. Uh you know, one and a half times the white width of our planet. So kind of a 
a super Earth rocky one, and the other one is a big Neptune-like planet. So big, gaseous, almost four times the width of the Earth. Probably has a rocky core surrounded by a huge atmosphere. Hmm. Now, what they think is these two most likely did not form in sync like this. One probably had, you know, in formed where it is. And the other one probably got pulled in. Pulled in a little closer. There's some planets that we see kind of form at one one orbit and then kind of shift to a different area. Right. Uh, actually, somebody in the, the chat room, Crash Bandicoot, says, um, you know, asks about what kind of effect that would have on tides. And there is, there is some... There's some looking at that going, there's going to be some effect. I mean, it's not going to be as great as the moon on the earth. Mm, you don't think? No, just because the distance speaking. Mm, okay. Distance and mass. And, oh, okay. Um, just because one of them is really gaseous. The other one is, you know, a super earth. So one is really dense. One is really, you know, fluffy. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, yeah, by comparison, earth, yeah, in, in comparison, and the sun, uh, the moon, and the earth are both kind of rocky, and the moon is fairly close in, right? So, but yeah, they're gonna have some sort of, some sort of tidal, you know, action going on, especially when they come into to close orbit. You know, you can see each other. You can look up and see the other planet like a moon, and you know, every ninety-seven days. So at that point, there's probably going to be some tidal action on these. But not so great because if it was too great, then it would have, you know, disrupted the the planet itself. Right. It would have, it yeah. would have torn each other apart. Yeah. So yeah. this is another one of those cases where it's like, huh, interesting. All right, go back, fiddle with the code again. Right. What we think is going to happen. Let's relook at this because this kind of yeah, this kind of changes things a bit. Yeah. Hmm. I always like that though. Yeah, so it, it's kind of an exciting week. We had a new, a whole new type of thing. We didn't really think that two planets could orbit like this together. Yeah. We had those, so kind of a new idea of what's going on. And the fact that we could actually observe some of these from Earth at a really cheap, you know, really cheap alternative to Kepler. Yeah. I mean, Both of those discoveries were with that, with that $75,000 ground telescope? Uh no, I don't okay. think so. Just the uh, just the one. Yeah. Still pretty awesome. Yeah, but it it's interesting because I mean Kepler will have a day, you know, that it's not going to be there, and will we have a stopgap between it and the next telescope? I'm not sure. Mm. Also, Kepler only looks at a little portion of the sky. It's able to check out a specific chunk of the sky, right. and that's what it watches. Right, right. There's a whole swath of the rest of the sky that it's not looking at. Yeah. And these two telescopes are able, one in the northern hemisphere, one in the southern hemisphere, let us get a better idea of what's happening everywhere else. Now, it's not going to be able to catch the the tiny stuff that Kepler can. Kepler's going to get a lot more of the, the small planets and very detailed stuff that you really can't see on Earth because of the atmosphere. But these telescopes do offer us another alternative to catch some of the big ones. Mm -hmm. Can we catch some of them? So we're looking at the whole rest of the sky. I mean, we have this Kepler chunk of the sky and we're making estimates. All right, here's everything we see here. Let's estimate the rest of the sky. So maybe with these telescopes, we can say, okay, our estimates for the larger planets and larger systems of planets are, is this what we think will be on the rest of the sky? And this is what we actually see. To kind of tweak our, you know, our projections about what's out there. Mm -hmm. So That's it'll help. Exciting. Yeah, so it'll help that. The fact that it's, you know, off-the-shelf technology, I really love that. That somebody, you know, they've gotten together to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. So it's more likely to be able to have, have these types of telescopes and maybe would there be more, but just, I mean, there are a handful of them that can look at the sky right now. But if something happens to one of them, then it's not so scary to have to replace it. You Makes know, if... Sense. If a mirror gets cracked for some reason, if there's enough of a temperature change yeah. or something like along those lines, then you're not, you know, out like, okay, that's it for this one. Yeah. See you later, guys. It's, you know, you, there's not a, such a big gap on the money that you cannot replace them or add 
other telescopes in different locations. You know, if the... That's what I like. Yeah, the, you know, the night sky in specific locations will have um, a certain amount of, you know, light pollution. You know, in the city, you can't see as many stars as you can in the country. So maybe you can spot different of these telescopes in darker locations. Or if one gets a little brighter, then, you know, have another one in a different location. So there's a lot of options with this. You know, we're seeing all these crazy type of things and we're able to look everywhere else in the sky now too. Yeah, it's, uh, as as the price point comes down, the uh, barrier to entry gets goes down. And so univers- universities can start affording things like this. Yeah. I mean, the deployment opportunity just goes way up. Oh, yeah. So you can have, you know, if you do, if you have all these, you know, think about that, all these uni- universities having it, and then you have lots of undergrads, you know, or grad students being, you know, assistants or their professors and being down in the little basement doing their thing then you have a lot more eyes on this type of thing you have more computer time you have all these different you have everything coming together to look at this data right so there's a lot it's funny because every once in a while these things this exoplanet stuff comes out it's always like wow big news and then like a month or two later wow more big news yeah yeah yeah, absolutely. And think how awesome it would be if those telescopes were on moon bases. Right, Heather? Or Mars bases. I would totally run one for Mars. <laughs> totally. I would make that sacrifice. You're, yeah, you know what? You're such a patriot. I know. Uh, any other thoughts on that story? Uh, not that I could think of except planets. I know, I know, I know. Well, let's take a quick brief moment because we have something kind of cool going on right now. Now, of course, everybody knows... That if you ever bought a nose, Heather, if you go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and you scroll all the way down to the very bottom of our fine website, perhaps you stop and open the latest episode of Coded Radio in a new tab, because why wouldn't you? And then you scroll all the way down to the very bottom. We have links down there for Amazon US and Amazon UK and Newegg and ThinkGeek, and those are all really fine. Heather, I added something yes. new yesterday. You did. It's called Code School, and it's a, it's a, oh. it's a really awesome resource to learn about development and they uh, they give you real life examples and let you do things and actually code to learn and there's an affiliate link right there if people want to check that out but what i want to point your attention to over at amazon.com is the ncaa football 13 i know some of you out there from the old lotso days love this one and if you're going to pre-order it you can do so using our affiliate link that we will have in the show notes for either the xbox 360 or the playstation 3 and then when you get yourself that video game you can support jupiter broadcasting Two. Link yes. in the show notes. So uh, check that out. NCAA Football 13 from Electronic Arts. It's one of those that uh, you love to hate. You know it, people. You know you're <laughs> going to get it. So use our link if you do that. And uh, thank you to everybody who supports the network with our affiliate links. All right, yes. Heather, why don't we move hey. on to the news bite? Wow. What is the first story yeah. in the news bite? A 50 gigapixel mega camera. Oh, man. I, I, I know. I only have 11 in my camera. Yeah, I know. You think your camera is all awesome. Yeah. You're like, oh, wow, I want to get this one. And I saw like the headline, 50 gigapixels. Wow. And I was like, what? Wow. I don't get it. Yeah. So how is this like, is this like 100 cameras combined and they're kind of cheating and saying that? Or what is going on really? Only sort of, kind of. Aha. I knew it. So, I mean, to make better optics, get these, you have, you know, more glass elements, which increases the complexity, you know, of all these things going. So what they've done is they've stitched together images of 98 individual cameras, which kind of comes out to 960 million pixels. Yeah. So, yeah, it is sort of kind of a whole bunch of cameras stuck together. But what they're able to do is capture all of these, you know, I mean, we're talking 4 to 80, 8 to 40 megapixels general camera. So the resolution of this camera is actually like five times better than human vision. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's something. It it has the resolution to see something a little less than four centimeters wide, a kilometer away. So the realistic question I have for you is how can they, I mean, I'm sure they probably didn't actually answer this, but how how can they have anything that displays the quality of this image? You know, I mean, like the 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 probably the resolution that the displays they're viewing them on can't come near the actual resolution of the image. 
mean, they're going to get close. Eventually, they, they to... might be able to do it, but yeah. Well, yeah, they're going to... I mean, it they seems have some... like what they recommend you use it for is like to be able to take sections of an image that's that large and then crop that down and you can just zoom and zoom and zoom and enhance like CSI style. Yeah. So That's something. Yeah. I mean, other cameras have kind of done similar to this, except they do more of a, you know, a, a span. You know, so they start the camera over here and it kind of scans the scans the crowd like um i know my uh, my high school class you know they had the the senior picture and the camera starts way over here and it sort of pans around the the thing so you know somebody on one side of the crowd like waves and then when the camera gets to them they're stopped and then you wave back and the camera doesn't see the wave because it's not pointed at you at that point mm. but th what this camera is able to do is take them all at the same time so there's not any distortion because of that the flag's not fl blowing this way then that way you know, because the wind changes. It's one picture all at the same time. And what I've done is they're not taking exactly those. They're, they've all um, overlapped them all. Yeah, yeah. Kind of you know, stitched together, stitched them together right, you know, in a much better way. Yeah. You know, and there's the the box itself is kind of weird. It's like it almost two and like a half. almost like a fan. Yeah, it's like two and a half square feet, 20 inches deep. But only about 3% of it is camera and the optics. It looks like, okay, here's what I can identify, is I can yeah. identify a uh, network switch, uh, mm -hmm. either Cisco or HP brand, good switch though. A lot of, all the yellow is Cat5 Ethernet cables. Mm -hmm. um, and I see some cooling fans. Yes. Uh, so it's a PC. Yeah, so it's... It, it, it's a series of Ethernet connected devices. Yeah, so the majority of it is, is you know, the Ethernet, the cooling, the control boards, you know, to keep everything from overheating. That's interesting. I mean, so this huge box, 3% is camera and optical elements, and the rest of it is getting all the information together and, you know, making sure it doesn't melt itself down. I'd love to see this thing from another angle. I know that sounds stupid, but no, that I looks know. like a really interesting piece of equipment, but they don't yeah, have I any other... I tried to find other pictures, like a video or something of it, and I was like, oh. Oh, it's DARPA. Cute. It's a DARPA funded, of course. Of course. Well, you know. <laughs> You didn't mention that part. <laughs> well, I, I didn't necessarily scan that. I was looking for the science. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, of course it would be, though. I mean, because this would be a fantastic surveillance tool. You could put, oh, I yeah. mean, think about the, I don't know about how expensive one of these one of these things are, but they could deploy one of these things and they could monitor a massive region. So, oh, yeah. I mean, I could understand why the defense industry would be interested. Yeah. It's funny. You, uh, you know, the image of the show notes shows the big, you know, 50 gigapixel image. Yeah. And they've got like little square boxes and then like, output and you're like oh i can read the words on that sign and it's really far away that's cool that's cool they, now it won't be in your cell phone anytime soon i don't think no but they think like in in five years or so it might no be available to public oh okay. okay okay not necessarily in your phone but like yeah you know the the nice camera that you take you know that somebody has at the zoo and you know are taking pictures of things yeah no birds and things that somebody could actually have that in their hand yeah, I just, can see just that. that is is very intriguing to me that these, you know, it's all about just getting all the the elements small enough. Right. I mean, the, the camera parts there, we have that technology. Yeah. We have the technology. It's it's all about, you know, getting the control boards and the cooling down. And I think some of the details too are in sort of how why they have, what's the deal with that switch and is it is it requiring like the process? Because can you imagine? The image is so huge, it probably takes quite a bit of horsepower. Is, are they doing some sort of clustered processing there, or what are they doing? I'm just, I'm extremely yeah, fascinated I, by it. Yeah, they didn't really get into a lot of that. You yeah. know, well, because it's DARPA, they may have, you know, they they have a contract. They may not want to give away all the give goods. everything out. Yeah, I mean, dang it. I don't know whether they can give everything out. And some things, you know, I've had projects before where somebody comes in, they're like, yeah, here we go. We've done something similar. And you kind of vaguely talk around the details because you don't want to give up all the secrets. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's that. And, you know, also with that, with, the, with those kinds of details, too, it's such a minority of the public that actually cares. You know, people just like the numbers. They don't really care how. They don't. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're using uh, they're using the Linux kernel there with the uh, with the clustering support that it has there with the distributed file system. And, uh, you know, we're using yeah. uh, we're using kernel 3.0. Yeah, because uh, we haven't upgraded that thing yet because we built it a couple of years ago. <laughs> I so, love the accent you're trying to do. I mean, you know, that's kind of kind of details I want. And they're not going to share that with anybody. So I, well, mean, I just I don't know what I'm hoping for. <laughs> that's OK. But 
it is an interesting different angle that, that, you, that you brought up. You're like looking at the picture and Im- immediately you're like, oh, I can identify this. I can identify that. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of it is, you know, what you're, what you're used to and what your knowledge is. Because I've seen pictures like that oh, yeah. of, of astronomy or, or space or, you know, rocketry or anything like that. The aerospace thing. I'm like, oh, I can kind of see what's going on here. Yeah, it's like, and well, there. wait a minute. I know what these parts are. I'm, I know this territory. I, I can kind of understand this. Yeah, you can kind of make a guesstimation of what's going on, yeah. even without all the details. Yeah. Of course, you know they have it on a nice clean table, yeah. and all yeah. kind of specific angle, everything going on. But yeah, and that's the front of it too. We're looking at there. That's the camera lens right there, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. Hmm. Pretty cool. Any other thoughts on that one? No, the the headline just grabbed me on that one. Yeah. No kidding. All right. Well, uh, this next story, when I saw the headline, I thought, what? This sounds like some hippie crap. <laughs> but I think you're going to change my mind on it, aren't you? I think so. Okay. What is it? Languages heard around the world. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's very yeah. old radio of you. I like that. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. So what's going on is that you have to realize there are over 7,000 languages spoken today. Wow. That we don't think will survive past the end of the century. Fragmentation. Yeah, we're we're losing a lot of these languages as you know, small communities, you know, get into larger communities and not many of the people still speak those languages. Mm-hmm. So what uh, Google actually has done is they've introduced the Endangered Language Project. It's people where they can go online, you can find and share information about these these dialects, kind of store it online to make sure that it has a better repository, maybe it lasts longer. So the it's made so you can you can upload video, audio, text files. You know, maybe you can go online and learn more about a language. Possibly try to, you know, see how it's spoken. Huh. There's actually a whole bunch of people that have already begun to contribute. It's been everything from 18th century manuscripts to teaching tools. Um, there's also things going. Yeah, there's also things going on. It also the ability of this going together. It lets them go and like talk to, you know, the elders of a, of a community. Some of these remote communities often they're the last speakers of you know the native language, their their old language. So they can go there, get them to record it. So it just has a, you know, has a pro- posterity to it. So it's it's their philanthropic arm, that kind of yeah. working together with. I love it when they do this stuff. Yeah, they're they're working together with the endangered languages catalog. I mean, pretty soon they're going to hand the whole thing over to them. They kind of oh, really? jump. Yeah, they're, they've jump started it. Um, in the next couple months, they're going to hand it over to the First Peoples Cultural Council. That's really cool. Okay, so now I like it even a lot more. Yeah, so they got it going. They're going to get a whole bunch of, you know, let the scholars take it, it after it gets rolling. And then, you know, hey, like, here, guys, you take it. I mean, it makes sense. They don't have to keep, you know, tabs on everything that's going on. They just kind of, wow, good, if good they run Google. the infrastructure, they can let the. Let the language people handle that. Right. And they still get the data. That's what they yeah. want. They want the data. Good guy Google. Yeah. Look at them go. I know. Sometimes they, they do the awesome. Yeah, they do. All right. Well, uh, do you want to talk about carrots? Yes. And not sticks. No. no. It's a positive work environment. That's right. Science says your boss should be nicer. Oh, science says this, huh? Science I says mean, it. I, I would have, honestly, that was kind of what I would have said too. Well, you know, it's actually a, a specific experiment where they had, you know, a whole bunch of people and they kind of play the roles of supervisor and employee. And so some supervisors um, were told, so one, one group, sorry, was said, okay, they get a bonus program. So if you do well, you get bonuses. And the others were said, if you don't work well, you get penalties. And so employers, employees worked for the bonuses. Yeah. Way harder. And they trusted their su- supervisors and everything was going much better. But if you had penalties, they didn't work as hard. They didn't like their supervisors. They kind of distrusted them. And it seems kind of obvious. Oh, yeah. But. Well, you know, uh, from my personal experience, uh, I had, I had, I was a contractor for many years. And for <laughs> the first few years, I had a work structure where after I had billed a certain amount of hours, I got a revenue share. And if I built mm-hmm. a beyond another set of hours, I got an even greater revenue share. And boy, will I tell you, did I manage to bill out all the way I could every time? And I meant 
you know, that meant working crazy amounts of hours and tons and tons of travel. And then as yeah. the company got older and they wanted more profit from that, they flipped it around and instead enforced a a, a, a penalty system where if you oh. didn't meet a certain amount of hours, you'd be penalized. And then, you know, yeah. so you really didn't have quite the same incentive to go as far. And the numbers for the entire, uh, you know, consulting crew around, mm. you know, the whole company dropped. Oh, yeah. It's like you said, is that if you have the bonuses, people work harder. harder. For the penalties, um, think, um, you know, salespeople people getting territory. You know, mm. they, if they don't meet a certain you know, quota, then they get a smaller and smaller territory right? to cover. And that's, it, it doesn't work. You know, it doesn't work well. They don't trust their supervisors. So it's interesting because it's something that you kind of think, it, it seems kind of obvious, but this, is, you know, this has been studies before I've done this, but this is the first one to include um, the trust factor with a supervisor. It, you know, it seems obvious, but if you have another source and one that you can say, you know, this came out of this, this uh, Michigan State University, so it's legitimate. Uh, yep. You know, I, I, the problem is this business just is stupid, and and people well, are just you know they just they they get get they get momentum in a certain direction, and this is how it's always done, and you know if, you know if you don't do this, then we do this, and it's just they don't rethink it, and so hopefully as stuff like this comes out and people start covering it, hopefully it'll make a few people reevaluate that. Yeah, I mean you're you're right. It's hard to change a work environment. Yeah, but it can go slow. It can change slow. And of course, you're going to have you know fall back into old patterns. Mm-hmm. But anything new, hopefully, you know, new businesses or if you start something up, you can, you can kind of see this and be like, you know, I want to be positive. And look here, you know, some more evidence that I really should be. So maybe more new businesses will start off that way, too. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Should we go to the next story? Let's go. All right. So this is a new possible diagnostics tool for Parkinson's. This sounds promising. Yes. It's kind of loops back on the languages idea. So what happens is, of course, Parkinson's is a degenerative disease. It, you know, it affects, you know, the, the system. Of course, most, some notable pe- people that have it, like Michael J. Fox, Muhammad Ali. Ah, yeah, yeah. So what somebody did is they were working on, uh, it was a young man working on his PhD. Well, not a young man, but mathematician. So he wrote a program to kind of apply algorithms, algorithms to voice disorders. So he's trying to run things through this, you know, through his program, all these different voices. And in the process, he found this, you know, he had this repository of vocal recordings by Parkinson's patients. You know, and the repository was essentially, you know, testimonies to help researchers learn more about the progression of the disease. You know, it was them just kind of talking about what was going on with them, how they felt. Uh-huh. And so it just kind of ended up in this database that he was, you know, churning through for voices. And he actually found that he was comparing them. He compared, you know, 50 patient voices um, to non-affected voices. And he could actually detect who had Parkinson's with an 86%. Really? Right. So there's no blood test for Parkinson's. Ah. So it's interesting. So he's trying to start up a bigger project now that he's kind of seen seen this. He has a website, has phone numbers. You can, you know, you can call in, leave, you know, you leave a voice message, you can upload something, you know, whether you have it or not, just so you can have the, as large of a repository as you can sure. to kind of see if it keeps going like this. Yeah. And it'd be interesting because, I mean, like anything, the earlier you can catch it, the, the better you are off and the more medication and therapy you can get. Mm-hmm. But especially this, because there is no necessarily blood test, it's essentially, it, you diagnosed it when you see all the, the symptoms. Right. And if this can be there, you know, it's one of those things where maybe it's just, you know, a scan. I mean, you run it through the program and, you know, a pretty good chance that you can actually get a positive note on this. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And more data means more and more accurate diagnoses. Yes, and there's some uh, links in the show notes that anybody decide to participate this. There's, uh, they've got websites for all sorts of different countries, so not just the U.S., our if there's any listeners outside the U.S., you can. There's phone numbers on there too. You can. Uh, so hopefully, you know, whoever wants to do that can go online and leave a recording, and hopefully, this will help the guy. And yeah. May, maybe get get this. Maybe get this going. What a cool thing the internet could kind of help uh, organize to then treat people. Yeah. That, that's really awesome. Yeah, and it's funny because this is not what he was going for. It's another one of those situations where somebody is going like, "All right, I'm going to study this." They're like. 
huh, this is different. And it kind of shoots off in a direction. He's like studying just vocal disorders. Huh. You know, he's you know working at that. And then he suddenly, this bit of data pops up in his system. What would, gosh, it makes a lot of sense that some sort of issue, some sort of body symptom could be betrayed through the voice and through the way we talk. And Yeah, I mean, it's a nervous system disorder. Yeah. So, but it would show up in the vocal cords or start to show up there. And in the tongue and whatever else. I mean, it's yeah. all, yeah, it's all, they're all affected. Yeah, so, so the, so it's really exciting that this could be there. I mean, it does make sense and it's exciting this could happen and. It is one of those that still, I'm always kind of amazed about these these stories where it's sort of something pops up in a different set of data. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like, wow. And Out of nowhere, or, you know, you, you get data in the data, it's like, wow, wow, did not even expect that to be where I was going, but now this is an incredible discovery. Yeah, and it was, you know, he, so he had all this data from, you know, a public repository, so it's, you know, all this free open data, so he plugs it into his system, finds something different, and now he's like, oh, well, I need a bigger subset of data. See, you know, see how this continues to work. Very cool. Very mm-hmm. cool. Any other thoughts? No, I think that's about it. Well, check this out, Heather. We've leveled up over here at Jupiter Broadcasting. That's right. We have uh, a new project that's underway. Ooh. And uh, it's called Jupiter Radio. And it's very, very early, ground zero days. But uh, I'm putting a call out there for people that might be interested in hosting a uh, radio broadcast on our jblive.am stream. And mm. uh, if you go over to uh, bit.ly slash uh, DJ Draft, you'll find our form over there where we'll ask you a few questions, what kind of show you'd be interested in your name, and if you've done shows before and things like that. Not all, you know, nothing, there's no requirements as far as like, you don't have to have done a show before. But if you have, I'd like to see some of your previous work and things like that. And over the next few weeks, uh, we're going to start putting together a 24-7 uh, mix of different uh, podcasters and uh, people that organize like music playlists and and have a couple of different shows that will be on the JB Live stream, the audio stream. This is all going to be wow. radio stuff, internet radio. Um, in fact, if you have uh, like VLC or uh, some sort of uh, internet IceCast compatible or Shoutcast compatible streaming software, you can just put in uh, HTTP colon slash slash JB Live dot FM and it'll just start streaming right off of that stream that we're going to be using. Now, right now, it's just brought, it's just our, uh, like a 24-7 playlist of our, our reruns. Mm-hmm. But uh, in the next few weeks... We'll have uh, a lot of different shows on there from different people who've signed up at that DJ draft, and they'll be doing their things. They'll be some people be uh, rebroadcasting existing shows. Some people have brand new shows they're going to create on this. So it's going to be a, a neat thing for the community to just kind of tune into throughout the day or throughout the night or just something to fall asleep to or whatever, and and just passively listen and and enjoy. So uh, it's going to be pretty cool. So if you're interested in doing something like that, go over to bit.ly slash DJ Draft. Mm. There you go. All right, Heather. Well, uh, see, isn't that neat? Didn't, don't you think that's cool? Yeah. Funny? Yeah. All right. Well, then why don't we do a spacecraft update? There it is. I was waiting there. for the side by computer. I know. I was like, hello, computer. <laughs> Every now and then, the computer's processing a pretty large science job, Heather. Okay. Yeah. So what do we got in the update today? The shuttle Enterprise. It's, it's hanging out on the deck of the Intrepid up oh. in uh, New York City. So now it has a little inflatable canopy. So it's got its tent, a pop-up tent that it's covered by. That's cool. Yep, so that popped up. It's any of these are you're required to have a specific set of environmental protections for the shuttles. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the temporary thing you know, going on. And actually what I find interesting is that they're actually thinking about the permanent location. It's not as it's still undecided. Oh really? Jeez. It may not. It may not be on the deck of the ship. They're actually saying they're considering doing putting it up across the street, where there's an aircraft carrier docked. So there's a museum on the pier too. So they're thinking about one of those two locations. They haven't quite decided where it will be yet. Hmm. I I can't believe at this point they haven't figured that out. Well, you know, they've still got a little time. They you know they have their little their shelter now. Yeah. So you know. 57 feet high, 78, you know, yeah, but, encompassing the, the wingspan still, of it. I mean, it seems like that's like before you even start moving it, you get that you get that part figured out. Yeah. It's well, kind of like jumping in the car to go down to like another state and you haven't picked a hotel. I mean, you can do it, but no, that's not true because moving a shuttle is a massive endeavor. It's nothing like that. It's way worse than that. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, the whole deck of this ship had to be reconfigured <laughs> to take the weight of the shuttle. Oh, my gosh. They had to have a huge crane drop it down in this location. Now it's got Very a specific. Tent, gosh, how cool would it be to go inside that tent? Yeah, and it's actually going to be open to the public on July 19th. <gasps> no. So if you were in New York or anywhere close to New York and you feel like driving up there, because it'll be on the deck of the ship right now, you can go up, hop in a giant silver tent, that and is, check out the Enterprise. That is so awesome. <sighs> so now I'm jealous of everyone who lives in and around New York. Yeah, so, you know, somebody needs to go do that and then send us some video footage because we got to see oh, that. Yes. Or a picture or something and just email it to sidebite at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Yep, I want to see that. You know, Twitter one of us and we'll we'll retweet it and yeah. you know, try to include every, anything you guys uh, you send in the show. Totally. All right, what's our next uh, spacecraft update? SpaceX. We have more news. All right, good. It never stops. I'm always excited. So now it's almost like they're in the middle of a space race, a different kind of space race. Okay. They're getting ready to build a whole new launch pad, you know, for space exploration technologies. Really? You know, for all their Falcon rockets. They, they don't want to stay in Florida at the Cape Canaveral site uh, because yeah. NASA is going to be launching stuff, um, you know, various military things launch there, and they want to be completely separate. And they, they, don't, don't, want, they want, don't want NASA getting in their way when they're trying to launch and stuff, huh? Yeah, they don't want to be delayed because another another system is launching or it got delayed and now they have to, you know, change the schedule. So they want to have their own place so they can set up their own rules and their own timing and hmm. they launch when they want to. Mm -hmm. The problem is this comes with, you know, hundreds of paying jobs, you know, supporting companies will pop up around, you know, there's a whole community. Oh, yeah, sure, but it's a massive this. investment for SpaceX. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, not just an investment there. I've been to the, uh, the Houston Visitor Center down in uh, Houston, well, in Houston for NASA. Yeah. And the community around it, there is like all these little spots that are like NASA, you know, there's a whole bunch of you know little restaurants and yeah, shops yeah. and groceries. They're oh, just, yeah, it's a whole economy down, down there. there. Yeah. It's, you know, really close to it. So anyone leaving or getting to the visitor center has to pass these things. We're like, oh, I want to go eat here. It's kind of uh, it's kind of like how around a, around a big college, a lot of the immediate town is really kind of geared towards serving the college and yeah, you know, makes money off people coming and going and things like that. Yeah. So you're gonna have, you know, the paid jobs on site. You're gonna have this essentially whole little town pop up around it almost. Yeah, that's so be great. lots of people want this. Yeah, sure. They haven't quite decided where they're gonna have it though. Ooh, I vote Washington. <laughs> well, right now, the uh, highest contenders are Florida, Texas, and Puerto Rico. F more Florida? Yeah, likely chances are no. Florida Puerto Rico? That's not even, no. That's not, no, Texas would be great, though. Yeah, the South Texas is what's kind of looking as the more likely. I'll put, I'll put money on that's where it's going to be. Because, yeah, I mean, price-wise, that's going to have to be like, like way cheaper than Florida. Yeah, the and the whole point is why they won't, you know, hit Washington is the closer to the equator you are, the cheaper it is to launch. Yeah, yeah, I know. Because I know Washington is just so gosh. No, because the the earth circling um I at know. the equator gives them the most I know. extra boost. It's cool. We got Canada, so we're hanging with Canada. I don't mind. Yeah, you hang out with Canada. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's all right. So, they haven't quite decided yet, but they have recently met with um Texas governor, so they're kind of Talking with various people, it looks like Texas is probably likely, uh, somewhere in southern Texas, more likely of the three, but they haven't stated it yet, so. Okay, okay. All right, Heather, I have a challenge for you. Okay. Let's say I had a three-year-old son, and I want to describe to him what the International Space Station was. Mm -hmm. Let's say my son is also an iPad fanatic. Can you solve yeah. my quandary? I can, or NASA can. <laughs> okay. They have created a free app. Has NASA is you know they do the free stuff, so they have for smartphones for tablets, you can navigate through kind of a realistic 3D recreation of the space station's flight control room. Oh, cool! So you can like walk up and down the aisles and see what's going on. You can actually look at certain stations. It'll tell you you know what's going on here, or give you an updates of this. Like like live like 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 it's live information. Yeah. Oh, It'll that's show cool. You where it is in orbit, so you can relative to its position, 
I love the movie. So you can see this is where it is. It'll give you the rundown of the cruise schedule for the day. I will feel like I'm in mission control. Oh, you know, cool. It won't, you know, it'll have like the layout of the station. So it won't show you like the little person, like, you know, walking around the space station or floating around the space station. No spy here cams. No, no, it's no spy cams or no little representatives. You know, no little dots kind of moving from one area to another. But they will list down, you know, their schedule and what they think they're going to be doing that day. Huh. So you kind of like, oh, this is what they're going to be doing at the space station today. And really, you, know. you can so actually you can follow check- their schedule. Wow! So this is yeah, like you this can is check for, out. Oh man, the the work crews, the the temperatures on board the space station. So there's a lot of nifty information about there. Well, there you go. And we have a link to the information about that in the show notes. So if you want to get an app for that, for that space station, got a space station? There's an app for that. Yep, there's an app for that. <laughs> wow. Well, uh, does that uh, does that make you want to get a tablet at all, Heather? It makes me kind of wish. Really? Wow. Wow. That's remarkable. That's remarkable. Hey. Well, well, you know what? I guess uh, I guess everyone eventually gets the bug. Everybody. That's, maybe that's oh, why yeah. they, that maybe that's why they sell so many of them. I'm gonna yeah. get it. I'm, I'll get it. I've got an iPad here at the house. I'll get one of those. Hey, there you go. Yeah. All right, Heather. We'll step in the old time machine, okay. would you? It's time to okay. go back. Here we go. Close the door. Okay. Close. Oh, that one tickled. Oh, a little static shock on that one. Oh, boy. Okay. You're too close to the door. Yeah, I know. I know. It's Whenever we go more than 100 plus years, even if it's just this one. This one takes us 104 years ago, June 30th, 1908. That is right. The Tunguska meteorite. Okay. A lot of people have maybe heard about this. Um, north Northwest Russia, around 7.15 in the morning in 19, oh, June 30th, 1908. Huge fireball. Almost as bright as the sun. Streaks across the sky. A couple minutes later, huge fra- flash. Shockwave felt up to you know, 400 miles, 650 kilometers away. So it was probably 50 meters in diameter. It was traveling over 25 kilometers a second Whoa. at 60,000 miles per hour. Whoa. You know. That so, is, And that didn't cause a massive... No amount of damage or what? No, actually, what happened is it uh, exploded above. It didn't hit the ground, really. Oh, good. Yeah. So, it, but the blast, so it detonated about 6 to 10 kilometers above the ground, releasing 10 to 50 megatons of DNT. <laughs> you know, slight explosion. Yeah. You know, wow. Destroyed over 2,000 kilometers of forest. No trace of life. So... What they think actually happened is that this was, this may have actually been a comet. There is a, there's no, it's kind of hard. They, there is a meteor storm that crosses Earth's orbit twice a year and that it happened during that time. Mm-hmm. So there was a specific meteor storm that it could have happened in no. or it could, a lot of likely sources say it's probably a comet because of the way it exploded and there's not a lot right. of rocks. Right. You can, don't see a lot of rock down there but beneath the explosion. Mm-hmm. Granted, it's very boggy and granted, it was, you know, a little while before they, uh, it was 1927 before they actually had an expedition to get out there. Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, a little bit of effort to put together. You know, almost 20 years before a scientific expedition, expedition made it out there. Huh. So, you know, before a meteorologist, uh, me- mineralogist, sorry, got out there. You know, they had in 3080 rates for some aerial photography from the area to kind of survey the central part of the forest that was leveled. You know, they had, and the negatives of those photographs were burned. Oh, really? In 1975, by order of uh, the uh, USSR Academy of Sciences. Oh, you're kidding me. They, they said it was a fire hazard. That was their claim. And so they destroyed all these, all the... That's weird. Yeah, it is kind of weird. There's, it's like, huh. Sounds, that sounds uh, suspicious. That sounds suspicious a little bit, I think. I think. Yeah, which yeah. is why there's some conspiracy people that say, alien. No, not really alien. No, you're kidding me. No, of course there's people that's going to say that. Oh, that's perfect because there's this huge thing. There's not a lot of rock, so it doesn't yeah. quite meet the standard stuff that you would see. And then they cover it all up. You know what? Uh, That's totally aliens. <laughs> no. 
No. All right. Well, you know what? The uh, the old uh, side bike computer here, Heather, is flashing at me. Let me. Uh, oh yeah. Let me see what this. Oh, it's time to look oh. up into the sky this week. Yeah. So Wednesday, June twenty seventh, in the evening, uh, the moon is actually going to form a triangle with Spica. It's a star. That's blue white. And Saturn, which looks more golden. Saturn's going to be at the highest point. So there's going to be a triangle of uh, the moon, a blue-white star, and a golden star, which is actually Saturn. Hmm. And that's going to be at the top of the triangle. Wow. Thursday, uh, the next day, the 28th in the evening, now Saturn and Spica are going to be to the right of the moon. They're going to – they'll stay about five degrees or three fingers apart. Uh, apart. So that's uh, three fingers held at arm's length is about five degrees. Huh. And just remember when you see the two of them, the golden one is Saturn, the white blue one is a star, Spica. By the time we get to um, low at dawn, actually, you're actually starting to see Venus and Jupiter. You know, Venus had the transit a few weeks ago. Yeah. Now it's moving more and more in the in the morning. So they're actually getting pointing to uh, a star cluster, the Pleiades. A little bit higher than Jupiter, a um, little bit farther away than Jupiter is from Venus, and it's uh, seven sisters. So there's a little, maybe it looks like a little fuzzball, but it's actually individual stars. Which, yeah. oddly enough, um, some ancient societies, uh, the Romans used as a, essentially an eye chart. They said, "How many stars can you see? You're an no archer. Kidding, How many cool. stars you can you see? That's great. Oh, you're a you're a swordsman. So you know, the more stars you could see, the better your eyesight was." then you could be an archer. Not bad. Oh, no yep. kidding. <laughs> yep. That's Friday. Then Friday, just about um, right before dawn again, the red star below Venus, not actually going to be Mars. Mm. It's going to be Aldebaran, a giant red star. Mm -hmm. So you'll see Venus and Jupiter, then there's a red thing underneath. You'll wish it was Mars. I'll wish it was Mars. Right. But actually, it is actually a star. Well... That's okay. It can't always be Mars. No. no. Well, there we go. I believe that brings us to the end, right? I think so. And just a note, uh, no Cybite next week. Taking That's the, right. Taking the week off. off for the holiday. So everyone enjoy your science and then save it all up for uh, the week after that. And yeah. uh, Cybite is live over at jblive.tv on Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. Pacific, 10.30 Eastern. And then it's available for download just shortly after that over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. You can also subscribe to get the show automatically every single week. And you don't have to worry about it. All right, Heather. Well, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, everyone. Have a great week. See you in two.